My name is Shivra Rush, I'm an employment lawyer. Um, I'm with a firm called Lewis Silken who are new to the Irish market. They're a very well established HR and employment firm in London and they recently set up an Irish office in Dublin in April. So we're delighted to be able to sponsor the event today. In particular because we run a campaign every year and our campaign this year is called This Place Minds and it's very much focused on mental health in the workplace and helping our clients to you know, maybe manage training, maybe manage employment law issues involving mental health. And it's great to see that it's so far up um, the agenda for organizations, particularly um, at the moment. I think, though, what, what I have seen, and, and I, I missed the beginning of Christine and John's talk in here earlier, but I know that Christine referred to her own mental health difficulties. And sometimes when you see employers you know, introducing mental health as an issue in the workplace, they'll say, oh, we all know somebody, maybe you have a family member or a friend who suffers from mental health. But actually, I think probably some people probably a lot of us in, the, in this room may have a mental health difficulty at some point in your lives. It might not be a very serious one, but I know when I had my first child, I wasn't right for the first few months, but didn't actually realize that there was something wrong. Or people have a bereavement, and that can lead to a real mental health difficulty. Now, it might not be a permanent one, but it is still something that they might just need a little bit of assistance in terms of being able to get out of bed and come to work. And, and it's really just about um, helping you go back to your workplaces and... Uh, you know, showing senior management what, what a, an issue this is at the moment. I'll take you through some cases. Another big issue that we come across as well is, um, you know, managers being worried about trying to manage employees who have mental health difficulties. And that, that's a real issue, particularly where, you know, they're trying to work within the confines of their sickness absence policies. They're trying to make sure that somebody maintains contact. And then the person says, well, I'm suffering from depression. You're, I feel like you're bullying me or you're stressing me out even more by requiring me to comply with the policy. It's just about, about managing that. And what I would say is, yes, definitely more sensitivity, more empathy is required. But there is no reason why an absence by reason of mental health shouldn't be managed in the same way not the same way necessarily, but shouldn't be managed in accordance with your policies. You just need to give managers the tools to be able to, to do it effectively. Um, I, I will focus, a lot of the cases will, will focus particularly on stress. Now, I'm a person who needs a bit of a Bunsen burner under her bum to actually get work done, so I like working with a, a small degree of stress, but it's when somebody is so stressed out in their work that it either makes them sick or you know, results in a, in, a, in a mental health difficulty and that's what we really want to, to focus on uh, today. Just, and, and very briefly, why has this become such a big issue for employers? Well, as you'll see, there are 15.4 million days lost to mental health each year and 55,000 people have health problems that are caused by work-related stress. Work pressures and bullying are the two main causes of work-related stress. Now, it might be something, it could be an interpersonal issue. It might not necessarily constitute what, what I would say is bullying within the legal definition of it. But workplace difficulties are a, a major um, issue. And to put it in terms of the bottom line, if you're going back to the business and trying to convince them why you need to put this on your agenda, it's estimated that three billion euro is the, is is lost to business in Ireland as a result of mental health uh, issues in a year. Um, not all bad news. Deloitte have done a, a, a worldwide study whereby they discovered that early intervention in issues involving mental health in the workplace has, can bring about a massive return on investment. So it's really about communicating with employees, engaging with employees at an early stage to show that, yes, we will help you with this, we will you know, work with you in order to either try and keep you in work or get you back to work you know, on terms that, that basically help us both. Um, and and that is, that's really important. But, and, and you know, 
I always say my clients hate calling me because when people call their employment lawyers, it's when something has hit the fan. And really what we want to try and do is encourage business to, uh, you know, put these issues on their agenda now so that it doesn't become an issue. But I'm, I'll, I'll now take you through some cases where you can really go back to your business and scare them. Um, our, the, the, the biggest issue that we see as a result of mental health issues is a disability discrimination claim under the Employment Equality Acts. So you'll all be familiar with what protected grounds are under the Employment Equality Acts. They are age, race, religion, gender discrimination, membership of the travelling community, sexual orientation, family status, marital status and disability. And the Employment Equality Acts basically prohibit an employer from treating an employee less favourably or discriminating against them on one of those protected grounds. The thing is that disability is defined really broadly in the Employment Equality Act. Uh, one of them is the total or partial absence of bodily or mentally function, bod bodily or mental functions. And then it sets out some other factors as well, but key to the mental health area is that the, the definition includes a condition, illness or disease which affects a person's thought processes, their perception of reality, their emotions or their judgment or which results in disturbed behaviour. Now that's very, it's very broad, it's also really difficult to manage. You're talking about how somebody feels, how they're thinking, how they're behaving. It's very difficult to, to pinpoint and, and to, to know when you know, somebody suffers, is suffering from stress or suffering from a difficulty to the point that it, that it will become uh, a disability. But I think, and, and if you were at the earlier talk with John and Christine, there were some really good tips about how to, to try and catch things early and, you know, changes in behaviour and, you know, approaching people to say, are you OK? Bear in mind also that it's not just employees, it's also applicants for employment. So uh, in one particular case where an employer was interviewing a, 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 a person who was suffering from a disability, they were a wheelchair user, but in fact, the employer perceived that they had learning difficulties when they didn't, and they discriminated against them on the basis of the learning difficulty. So it's not even necessarily a disability that somebody, they don't have to show that they're suffering from that disability. If they feel that a disability has been imputed to them or like a perceived disability, and they've been discriminated against on the grounds of that disability, they could potentially bring a claim as well. There isn't a threshold for, for how severe the disability has to be in order for an employee or, a, or an applicant for employment to be able to uh, bring a claim. Now, there is one case, it's called a government department versus a worker, where it was said that if, there, if, the, ability, if the disability is being suffered to an insignificant degree, that it could be disregarded. But again, that's going to be very fact specific. We really don't have any guidance in, in the legislation. What we are seeing is a bit of a sea change as a result of a, a European case called, and this is really bad pronunciation, I think it's Chacon Navas from the CJEU, where it was said that for a limitation of capacity to participate in professional life to fall within the concept of disability, it was probable that it would have to last for a long time. Now that case came out in 2014 and since then we are definitely seeing more cases where employers are challenging as part of a disability discrimination, whether the employee is suffering from a disability at all and whether it comes within the, the definition. One particularly significant case involved an employee who had had 23 days consistent absence and only two of them were uncertified. And uh, so there was absenteeism going on, but actually the employee then began to suffer from depression as a result of a bereavement. His father died. Um, and he disclosed that to HR, but at the time he was uh, involved in a disciplinary because of the absenteeism. Um, for some reason, I don't know what happened, but HR did not tell the manager who was doing the final disciplinary for where you know dismissal was uh, as a result. And um, he he was dismissed, and he said I he brought a claim saying I was dismissed because of my depression. The employer then said, well, no, actually, it was because of the absenteeism and you weren't that good a performer, so there was performance issues as well, and that's why you were dismissed. Fatally to their case, the manager who ran the last disciplinary uh, meeting said that had he known that this person was suffering from depression, that he wouldn't have sacked them. Um, so what the company tried to argue was he was 
and, and a lot of you who, who maybe deal with employees who suffer from depression, it can come in bouts. They can be very well for you know, a certain period of time and then there might be a change in circumstances and they might suffer from it for, for, for a period of months. And in this particular case, the employee wasn't being medicated anymore. So the employer tried to argue, well, he's not undergoing any medication anymore. So while he did have you know, depression, he didn't have it at the time of the dismissal, and that wasn't the reason why he was dismissed, but the Labour Court was having none of that. They said no, the, the company failed to inquire about the likely prognosis and whether he would be able to come back to work. And in fact, they were even more critical because they said that the employer kept themselves ignorant and sought to rely on subsequent events, i.e. the fact that he um, you know, became well after the depression and the employer then tried to, to <coughs> rely on that and say, well, he's not suffering from, from a disability. Um, the employee in that case was awarded €12,000. So you don't see very big um, awards sometimes on the disability discrimination cases. Um, however, bear in mind that if an adjudication officer in the WRC makes a determination against an employer, it can go further than just compensation. So many employers have been ordered to update their diversity and their equality policies. One particular employer was ordered to, to update their policies within three months of the decision. Um, and, and they were also told to reskill their, their management, to basically train, re do refresher training for management on equality within five months of the decision. Now, some of you might ask, well, how will the adjudication officer know whether we've done that or not? One employer was ordered to refresh the management training, and they ended up with a different employee back before the same adjudication officer about a year later and hadn't done what they were told to do in the previous case, and that was reflected in the award that... Uh, came about in the second one. As I've said, the, the definition of disability is, is, is very broad. The reason why I have a pic picture of a little rat there is because a rat phobia has, been, uh, has, has come within the definition. There was an employee who suffered, a, she had a very severe reaction as a result of exposure to rodents in her workplace and was then harassed by her employer as a result of it and suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, that, was, that, that came within definition of disability. You'll see the other standard ones like alcoholism, um, short-term injuries, but it can include a condition or illness which existed but doesn't exist any longer, and as I've said, an, an imputed one. There was one successful case. Boots actually managed to successfully uh, argue that a, a particular um, injury didn't fall within the definition of disability, and it was an employee who had injured his ankle on a shelf in the shop. Uh, went to the Oc Health nurse, got some treatment, but didn't have to have any follow-up treatment. And Boots successfully argued that that was, uh, that was not a disability. And, and what was significant there was the employee actually didn't take any sick leave as a result of that either. So it's, it's definitely established that stress, depression, anxiety are all, all fall within a, a, the, the definition of disability. But what does that mean for employers? Well, the Employment Equality Act does allow employers to discriminate on the basis of disability. Section 16 says that an employer is not obliged to keep anybody in employment or to employ somebody who, does, who, who is not competent and capable and fully competent and capable of performing the role that attaches to a position. However, that's limited. You can only rely on that as a defence or, or as an exclusion if you've adhered to the obligations to provide reasonable accommodation, which are set out in section 16.3 of the Act. And that can include adapting premises, uh, redistribution of tasks. Generally in the mental health arena, what you're looking at is, is uh, you know, rejigging working time. So all the, the examples that John and Christine gave earlier in terms of maybe allowing somebody to go on a three day, three day, four day week when they're coming back to work after a mental health difficulty, maybe adjusting their working hours for a short time. Um, the obligation to put in place measures of reasonable accommodation isn't absolute. If it's likely to impose what's called a disproportionate burden on employers, then they may be able to say, well, we can't provide those, those measures of reasonable accommodation. But bear in mind that um, in, in deciding whether a measure of reasonable accommodation is a disproportionate burden or not, the financial um, ability of the employer to absorb that kind of thing will be taken into account. Whether there's any public funding which would be available to them and putting in place measures of reasonable accommodation is also taken into account as well. 
But in general, what is required is a very much a proactive approach to finding suitable me measures of reasonable accommodation. And in particular, and it's one thing that Christine said earlier, it's about engaging with the employee and not necessarily putting a plan in place and saying, oh, well, here's the plan and here's all the measures of reasonable accommodation that we have for you. It's about sitting down with them and saying, this is what we think. What do you think? And, and you know, can you give us some feedback and, and let us know what you think about that? Also bear in mind that it won't include any treatment or facility or thing that the employee might ordinarily provide for themselves. So that would include something like hearing aids for, for um, an employee who's, who's hard of hearing. The two most significant cases in this area, um, the first one is quite an old one now, Humphreys and, and Westwood Fitness, and uh, it has been changed a little bit by the Nano Nagel case, which is still in the courts and one that should be um, you should really keep an eye on it because it, it's very significant. In the Humphreys case, it involved an employee who, um, she suffered from anorexia and that was found to constitute a, a, a disability, but she also suffered from depression. She had um, a good bit of sick leave. She was dismissed because the employer said that she was a danger to the children. Now, the employer came to that decision without having had any risk assessment carried out and had no medical evidence to, to uh, to prove that this was in fact the case. So the Labour Court found that she had been dismissed as a result of her um, disorder. And they said that for an employer to avail of the defence whereby they say, we're not obliged to keep somebody in employment if they're not fully capable of doing the job, the employer must have made adequate inquiries to establish the factual position um, in relation to the employee's capacity to do the duties. And what they really f said was, there's a two-stage test here. Firstly, the employer must find out what's the degree of the impairment and what's the likely duration. And really, an employer can only do that based on medical evidence. The second part of the test is then what special treatment might make the employee fully capable of doing the job, i.e. what measures of reasonable accommodation could be put in place. And again, that's probably information that you can get either from an employee's doctor or your own doctor or Oc Health or an occupational therapist. Um, the, the Labour Court there also said that the inquiry will only be adequate if the employee is allowed to participate and present medical evidence. Now, this was recently somewhat changed by the Nano Nagel case, and I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with this case, where it was a, an employee who already suffered from a disability um, and was working as a special needs assistant in a school for children with special needs, but she then very tragically had an accident and was confined to a wheelchair after that. She spent nine months in rehabilitation and the occupational therapist in the hospital said she could come back and do probably nine of the 16 tasks that she had to perform as an SNA. The school said that they were unable to um, facilitate this and they said to their own doctor, well, if she can't do all of the job, well then, she's unfit for work. So the, the, the school's doctor said she's unfit for work and she was dismissed as a result. So in the WRC, in the Labour Court, in the High Court, uh, they all found in favour of the employee and the Labour Court said the school really should have considered a redistribution of tasks amongst the other SNAs. They, sh they said, well, if she can do nine, you should take the other seven and maybe redistribute them amongst the other um, special needs assistants that are there. And the High Court upheld that as well. But the employer appealed and said, we shouldn't be obliged to consider removing fundamental tasks of the job that the employee can no longer do. Section 16.1 allows us, you know, it says an employer isn't obliged to um, maintain somebody in employment who isn't fully capable of doing it, taking into account the measures of reasonable accommodation as well. The Court of Appeal decision is interesting, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to go through it all. It's quite complicated. But essentially what the Court of Appeal said, they, they looked at how are we going to construe that defence in Section 16.1 with the reasonable accommodation obligations. And what they held was that there was no obligation to consider a redistribution of tasks. They said that the employer was not obliged to strip away the essential tasks of the job, so the fundamental core duties, really, as opposed to what, what might not be a, a core duty of the job. They said that the obligation is to consider the appropriate measures, including a redistribution of tasks associated with one or more duties attached to the position to enable the person to be fully capable. So what they were looking at is they took the, they took the job, they then took the duties of the job, and then they, they, 
they really got down into the minutiae of, you know, what are the tasks associated with that. And they said that an employer isn't obliged to remove a duty or duties which are the main duties or the essential functions of the position. And they said that if an employer isn't obliged to do that by virtue of Section 16.1, that then they're not obliged to consider doing it. Because the whole thing in Nano Nagel was that the, the employer wouldn't even consider the redistribution of the tasks as opposed to wouldn't do it. If they had shown that they had considered it, they might have been able to defend the case. A more controversial aspect of the Court of Appeal decision was that the court said that there was nothing in Section 16 to justify the rule of allowing an employee to influence the employer's decision. So you'll recall in the two-stage test in Humphreys and, and Westwood that the Labour Court said you can't come to a decision unless you present the employee with the information and allow them to make a, you know, to influence the decision. The Court of Appeal said there's nothing in Section 16 that requires an employer to do that. It is under appeal to the Supreme Court, and in particular on that point. So the the um, the appeal is that the the Court of Appeal, it's it's based on that the Court of Appeal made a mistake in making the finding that an employer doesn't have to consult with the employee or give an opportunity to consult before making a decision on reasonable accommodation. Other claims that can be taken would be unfair and constructive dismissal. Now, I think Nano Nagel would have been very differently decided if it was an unfair dismissal case as opposed to a disability discrimination case because in any, as you'll all be aware, in an unfair dismissal claim, an employer must show that they have a fair reason for dismissal and also that they have utilised a fair process in dismissing an employee. Um, capability is a fair reason for uh, dismissal. So if you have an employee who's no longer capable of doing the job, they potentially can be fairly dismissed, but they might still have a case for disability discrimination if you haven't looked at the measures of reasonable accommodation. A decision under the Unfair Dismissals Act will only be fair if the employee has been presented with all of the information. So if the employer has the, um, you know, preparing all the information, presenting it to the employee, and then allowing the employee to influence the decision, much the same as a disciplinary, you present them with all of the information or the charge against the employee and allow them to, to make submissions before you, you, you take what is pr a pretty drastic decision to, to dismiss them. The personal injury and, and stress claims, um, that we've kind of seen like a curve where we've seen, we, we saw a lot of stress claims kind of in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then they dipped. There was, you know, the courts don't like them. They take years and years. They're very messy. Um, and they can be hard for employees to win because what they have to show is that they're suffering from a genuine, you know, psychiatric or psychological illness. They have to show that there's a link with their work. And then the third hurdle really was where most people fell down, and that was around... Um, foreseeability. So they had to show that the employer was on notice of their condition and that the employer knew that if they continued to treat the employee in a certain way that the employee would get sick. There's one claim from last year which is interesting, it's a Hurley and Don Post. Um, the employee was awarded €161,000. Um, she had suffered post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of bullying and harassment in work and the employer was found liable. Now 50000 of that was for general damages for the kind of pain and suffering and, and that's what you'll see in a lot of the claims. The bulk of the award is for loss of earnings and then loss of earnings into the future if the person can't go back to work. But again, it's all about you know, the, the employer's common law duty of providing a safe place and safe systems of work and how important that is. But in terms of, of going back to your business now and, and you know, maybe looking at, well, how do we manage this? What can we do? What can we train our managers to do? Or what should they say or what shouldn't they say? Bear in mind that in disability discrimination or, or issues involving mental health, that is sensitive personal data, so always be cognizant. I know that GDPR was the huge tagline of last year, and really it still is. You've obviously got the additional bar when you're dealing with sensitive personal data, and there's very strict rules and regulations in relation to kind of collecting that, storing it, using and retaining it. Obviously, if you're collecting data, sensitive personal data on an employee in relation to their medical condition, if you're sending them for, for medical review, they need to know what the information is going to be used for, who's going to have access to it, if it's going to be disclosed, to whom it will be disclosed, and then that it is properly, um, you know, there's proper security for the, for the information that's there. 
I still get asked a lot whether employers can ask health questions on pre-employment questionnaires. And I say that you can, but if you ask the question and you get an answer and somebody doesn't get the job, you're potentially opening uh, the door to a disability discrimination claim on somebody, uh, on, a, on an applicant for employment. There's nothing wrong with asking questions about somebody's ability to do the job, particularly in the context of the Employment Equality Act. But it has to be focused on the job and not the person. It has to be around, here are the tasks to do the job. Will you be able to do, do them? Or if not, are there measures of reasonable accommodation that we will need to enable you to make you fully competent and capable of, of doing it? So it's OK to ask questions in, in those types of, of um, in, in, that, in that type of context. Again, um, I would say it's, it's really, particularly in mental health, it's about giving your managers the confidence to deal with the issues. I find that a lot of clients who call, it's, you know, the HR managers, the HR directors, they're at the end of their tether because the business is saying, you know, I, I can't deal with this person, I don't know what to do. And, and really, much and all as I, as you know, you might think lawyers like going to court, they really don't. <laughs> and from an employment law perspective, what we really like to see is employers who, you know, engage with these, um, these issues so that you don't end up in court, so that you do give your managers the tools to enable them to, to manage these issues. And it is maybe about reviewing your policies to make sure that they've been updated to take into account mental health difficulties, and it's not just about the normal slips and falls, flus, you know, the, the, the kind of things that, that, you know, before mental health came became high on the agenda would have been included in your sickness absence policies. Um, what I would say is the the communication is is really is key, and I think also as part of that review. So as I've said, we we we've launched um, this place minds um, in our own workplace, and it's about helping our clients as well, and you know giving them training about mental health in the workplace and, and giving their managers training. But I thought what what was really key was we had one of our managing partners stand up and and tell us about his own experience with mental health. His daughter is going through an awful time. She has anorexia at the moment. They've been in hospital with her. And, and having somebody from senior management do that, whereby the rest of the managers kind of see, OK, well, there are people up there like me who, who have difficulties and you know, who are still able to, to work and are being facilitated in work. I think that's really um, you know, very, very effective. So you know, don't be afraid to tell your managers, you know, use the policy. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a case in a few minutes, but use the policy. You can still require employees, even if they have mental health difficulties, you can still require them to maintain the appropriate level of contact. If they're out by reason of stress or, you know, depression, and it's as a result of something that's happened in work and is with their manager, then maybe have a buddy who they, you know, they call once a week to say, I won't be in this week, still putting in their certificates, still complying with the, the workplace policy, and just making it clear that your organisation does take its duty of care very seriously, does want to encourage the person to come back to work, will sit down and talk about measures of reasonable accommodation. But it does have to be um, a two-way street. And, yeah, it does. So you can only go on the information that you're given, OK? And I know that it is very frustrating where you get medical certificates that say, unfit for work, full stop. Um, or out by reason of stress, and then alarm bells are going off, and you're notifying your insurers because you're wondering, are we going to have a, a personal injury claim? But I would still say, keep on the track of management. Manage it as if it's an employee who's out for any reason. But obviously, more empathy, more sensitivity. But I just think, don't not contact the employee. That's where we see a lot of criticism of employers. Um, and as Christine said in the in the earlier. Um, session, you know, the isolation can be very, very difficult. Um, and in terms of, of absence management and, and getting medical information, if you're obtaining medical reports, just be very careful about the briefing notes that you're sending to doctors and, you know, what's the purpose of the medical report. If you have an employee who's still in work but who is suing the organisation, is the medical report for the purposes of that litigation and would that be privileged? Or are you sending them for a medical review to determine whether they'll be able to come back to work? And if it's the latter, 
well then that report could be disclosable to the employee, including any notes that you send to the doctor. So just be very careful about what you put in that. There was one case where an employer was heavily criticised because the note that was sent to the doctor for the purposes of the report presented a very one-sided version of events um, and contained a lot of information that really wasn't relevant to whether this person could come back to work and do the job or not. So just be careful around that. Return to work, I think Christine and John already um, covered that very well in terms of you know, looking for fitness to work certificates. A return to work meeting, and that's about getting the employee back and making them feel like, yes, we're happy to have you back. We need people to do the work here, and we're happy that you're here to do the work. And you know, if there are measures of reasonable accommodation, making sure that managers are aware of what they are if somebody is coming back on a three-day week, that that is effectively put in place. Um, I'm going to leave you with one case where an employer, oh sorry, yes, permanent health insurance, that is quite important obviously, where you provide it. If you have employees who are uh, potentially going to be dismissed but are entitled to permanent health insurance, get legal advice because you could be facing a breach of contract claim if you are, by virtue of the dismissal, denying them their right to permanent health insurance. But the reason that I've referred to it here is because Another case where the employer, you know the way I was saying earlier, employers are now challenging whether something is a disability or not. In another case involving an employee who'd been out by reason of stress and depression for six months, and she, she was making a recovery, so permanent health insurance insurers uh, reviewed her to see if she could go on to PHI, and they said, no, actually, she is fit to work. She's not suffering from a disability. The employer then tried to use that to say, we didn't discriminate against her on the grounds of disability. We, dis we dismissed her because of her absenteeism. But the absenteeism obviously was connected to the, to the mental health difficulty. And just because the permanent health insurers didn't say it was a disability doesn't mean it won't be a disability within the Employment Equality Act. OK, so just keep that in mind. A very recent case, actually, it was January 2019. And really annoyingly for, for, for lawyers and probably for you guys as well, if you're doing any research on the Workplace Relations Commission, is that you cannot find cases because they're all now called an employee versus an employer or a worker versus a company. Or, um, so it can be hard to, to, uh, to reference. But one case where an employer very successfully managed the, the communication and the, the working within the policies for an employee who is absent. Their employee had been working for seven years very successfully. Um, seems to have had a bit of a slip and was on a PIP, a, a performance improvement plan, um, was on a final written warning and then suffered a road traffic accident and, and the intermittent absences really became much more concentrated and much more lengthy and then began to suffer from stress as well. So went on long-term sick leave. The employer, you know, very quickly wrote to the employee to try and seek the facts about, well, you know, we just want to find out what's your prognosis, how long are you going to be out, you know, if, if and when you come back, what measures of reasonable accommodation are you going to need to help us get you back to work. The union, not too brightly, responded on the employee's behalf and said, oh, our member isn't fit and, you know, you're stressing him out by writing to him, stop writing to him, we'll meet you when he's fit to work. The company went back to him and said, well, hang on a second, we've got a duty of care here under the, the, the Safety, Health and Welfare at Work Act and all the other employer obligations that we have. And, you know, we think we, we need to know, it's, it's probably too late to meet after you come back. We want a, a capacity for work meeting with you to establish what we can do to, to get you back. Uh, the union then wrote back and said, you're now bullying our member. Um, which, of course, always sets off alarm bells. And I think that's why managers can be like, and, and in absolute fairness, of course they are. They're, they're worried about, about dealing with the issue. Lots of correspondence ensued. Both doctors said that the employee was, was unfit for work, but in any event, he eventually said he'd come to a medical capability meeting. And at that meeting, he sought a severance, which the company said, well, no, we want you to come back to work. You know, severance isn't an option here. And he then lodged a grievance claiming that he had been discriminated against on the, the, the grounds of disability. And, and we had this kind of standoff situation where you had the company who said, well, we want to meet you to establish what we can, you know, what reasonable accommodation you need to come back to work. And then you had the union saying, we're not talking to you until he's fit to work, but can we have a severance? So in the decision, and it's from January 2019, it's definitely worth um, reading, and, and it's a bit of a departure from the, uh, from the Nano Nagel, but the, the, the WRC said, well, 
The respondent was very engaged here. They made significant efforts to engage with the employee, but the, and the employee was given ample opportunity to, to engage as well, but really just refused and was quite critical of the employee, actually. They said, at best, she was reluctant to, to talk um, to the employer. And, and then when he did, it was really only to, to, to seek a severance. So that particular claim was lost to, by the employee. So the, the employer successfully defended that. And it's a good example of how even staying within your policies and trying to manage an absence from work, even where it involves depression or stress or, or a mental health difficulty, it can be effectively done. So key takeaways, absolutely prioritise mental health in your organisation. We are all switched on a lot more than we used to be. People are, you know, stressed out. Uh, and, and I think that, that the fact that it is moving so quickly up the agendas of, of organisation is a reflection of that. Review your policies, train your managers, and make sure that you know new managers coming in or people who are being promoted to management are given training in the area. And actually, they were talking about mental health first aiders uh, in the session beforehand, and I, I invited a client along who said, oh, I, I, can't, I can't come on Monday because I'm doing mental health first aid training. I'd never heard of it. I think it's amazing. It's a great, you know, it's just a really good tool and it's, it sounds like common sense but it might, might be something that a lot of people haven't thought of. Always have professional advice. Don't make any determinations based on whether you think somebody is able to do the job or not. You know, if they're suffering from a disability, you need occupational therapist advice or you need health advice or you need uh, advice from, from a, a GP. Always consider recommendations of reasonable accommodation and the, the disproportionate burden, whether the, the reasonable accommodation would constitute a disproportionate burden in the context of your organisation. Um, if you do make decisions, always, you know, or if you're, if you're swaying from your normal policy, if, you're, if, if you decide, oh, maybe something in the policy doesn't quite fit within this situation, always document why you're not adhering to your policy, because if any of you have been before the WRC, you will be aware the first question you'll be asked by an adjudication officer is, what's your policy? And the second question is, did you follow it? And if you didn't, you need to have a very good reason and you need to have documented that. Again, consult and engage with the employee. And I know the Nanonagel decision has cast a bit of doubt about this, about you know, how much input the employee should have into any um, decision around reasonable accommodation. But I think particularly in mental health, it's really important just to keep the lines of communication open. Thank you.